Are you looking for new ways to make your colors more intense and eye-catching? In that case, glazing might very well be the technique for you and is definitely something you should have in your repertoire. Glazing is a technique that consists in applying a thin layer of transparent paint over the surface. Paints can be mixed together to obtain new colors. This is sometimes called direct mixing, but they can also be applied in layers wet on dry. And this is the case with the glaze technique. I already have a video about glazing on my channel, but it's kind of old and I wanted to have a fresh look at this fascinating technique and investigate it more in depth. I'll try to avoid repeating myself, so if there's something that I didn't cover in this video, it might be in the first one, so make sure to check it out as well. Glazing is a very well-known technique in oil painting. In fact, it appeared at the same time as oil painting, right when it was invented. Pioneers of oil like Van Eyck and most of the Northern Renaissance relied heavily on glazes for their colors. It also became very popular in the Italian Renaissance with artists like Da Vinci and Titian who used glazes as an essential part of their process. How come glazing imposed itself so early during the pioneering days of oil painting? Well, you have to realize that back in the days, pigments were extremely expensive. Weight per weight, the most expensive colors were worth more than gold. And by the way, during the Renaissance, people were moving away from gilded backgrounds and were looking for more realistic scenes. Instead of gilding the background, artists were asked to paint big blue skies and luxurious red robes. So to do that, you couldn't only use the inexpensive earth pigments like burnt sienna, yellow ochre, etc. Highly chromatic pigments were required. And the economy was not globalized back then, and the rarest pigments, like lapis lazuli, had to be shipped at a very high cost, so you couldn't waste a single ounce of it. Now, let's imagine that you have a small quantity of very expensive lapis lazuli paint, or ultramarine blue, as it was called, because it had to be shipped by boat and because it was blue. And imagine that you need to paint a big blue robe for a large painting of the Virgin Mary, for example. Basically, you had two options. One, direct mix with the ultramarine blue so that the entire thickness of the painted layer is made out of the ultramarine blue pigments plus some white and dark. The second option is to work indirectly and start with a grisaille or a monochromatic underpainting to build up the bulk and the volume of the drapery so that the thickest parts would be made only of inexpensive pigments. Then simply let it dry and apply a very thin layer of transparent ultramarine blue. In the end, you get a blue drapery in both cases, but the second option drastically reduces the quantity of blue needed to paint the entire thing. I know I'm going way back in time, but keep this in mind because this historical element of the cost of the paint might explain why when modern chemistry was invented in Europe in the 19th century, when much cheaper alternatives and new alternatives could be produced, glazes started to fade away and become less relevant for painters. For example, this PB29 here is a synthetic ultramarine blue that can actually be produced synthetically and it doesn't have to be mined and shipped. And since it's much cheaper, it makes more sense to mix directly with it and why not start playing with thick brush strokes and heavy impastos just because it's fun and because it's, it looks great as well. And this explains why artists following the impressionist movement like Monet, Van Gogh or Sargent didn't use much glazing at all and were advocating for direct mixing and for the ad prima approach. Glazing is a structural, indirect way of mixing colors, whereas the Anna Prima approach relies on a direct, spontaneous use of colors 
alongside brush strokes. Before we go any further, if you want to learn everything there is to know about color and painting, you can check out my courses. You'll find links in the description box. My first course, The Practical Guide to Oil Painting Techniques and Materials, focuses on oil painting. It covers everything oil painting related, starting with the fundamentals and exploring the more advanced techniques. My second course is heavily focused on color theory and its application for painters. It deals with all the complexities of colors and how to understand the more advanced techniques. Both courses got great reviews, I'm very proud of them, so if you want to improve your painting skills, I'm sure they can help you a lot. Thanks for checking out my courses and let's go back to the video. So what is glazing? Glazing consists in applying a thin layer of transparent paint on top of the dry painted surface, resulting in rich, intense colors, almost like stained glass. Not every pigment can be used for a glaze, it requires semi-transparent or transparent paints. Glazes can create a unique visual impression. They seem to appear closer than regular paint. Therefore, it's usually not really recommended to use them for the background or objects in the distance because they really seem to pop out. On the other hand, they are very useful to highlight a prominent subject. A glaze actually has a depth in terms of, of optics that makes the color feel more intense than direct blends. Let's take an opaque pigment, yellow ochre, and a transparent pigment, quinacridone rose in this case. If these two paints are mixed directly together to form a single paste, the color of the rose dominates but the opacity of the yellow ochre cancels out the transparency of the paint. If, on the other hand, the yellow is allowed to dry and the rose is glazed on top, a very different optical mixture is obtained. Light goes through both layers, resulting in a subtractive blend, much like when you place a colored filter over an image. Let's take the example of these colored filters because they are pretty much like what's happening when you glaze. As you can see, they let light through, but they filter certain wavelength. A glaze works exactly like that. Thus, a white object glazed with red will appear red, but a blue or green object would appear black or at least very dark. Indeed, the light reflected by a green or blue object contains no red wavelength. As a result, if blue and green wavelength are absorbed by the filter, no light can go through. Any filter reduces the amount of light and therefore the more filters you add on top of each other and the less light can go through. So here with a green, blue and red filter, almost no light can go through because all the wavelengths are filtered by the various filters. All this is of course theory and although it's important to understand how filters work, the result of a glaze is much more subtle and more complicated than this. No pigment can be perfectly transparent and a small part of the light will always be diffused by the upper layer and therefore yellow glazed over blue has a different appearance than blue glazed over yellow. We can say that the order of the layers is not interchangeable. This makes predicting the result of a glaze very difficult and there are so many differences between pigments that it's actually quite impossible to predict with certainty the final result of a glaze before you apply it. The best technique is to do small sample tests on little scraps of canvas or on a small area of the painting that can easily be corrected. Another trick that you can use to give you an idea is to use a piece of glass. You first apply the glaze as you would put it on the canvas but first on a piece of glass and place it over the part of the painting that you want to cover with this glaze. And this should approximately reveal the effect of the glaze. 
In this example that you can see here, I'm using phthalo turquoise to glaze this red dress. And the idea is to get rid of this red. If you mess up, don't worry because the glaze can always be removed. And here's how to do it. First, apply it to a discrete area that you're not afraid to mess up and observe the results. If the color is not what you are looking for, you can use a clean, lint-free cloth to absorb the paint. Traces will surely remain visible and they will be covered once you have found the right glaze that suits you. Otherwise, you can simply retouch with regular opaque paint to undo the damages that you've done with this failed glaze. Different types of glazes. I like to differentiate two types of glazes, flat glaze and transitional glaze. First, let's talk about what I call flat glazes. Basically, a flat glaze, like its name implies, is applying a flat, uniform color layer over a relatively large surface to modify the color significantly. For example, change a yellow dress into a green dress or applying a red glaze over a grisaille. It can be used as a structural part of the color construction, for example, first applying a grisaille and then putting all the color in the glaze, or as a simple retouching technique here and there. For example, if the color you have painted initially is too cool for your liking, you can always apply a slight warm glaze to it, or if it's too warm, you can apply a cool glaze. If the painting is already finished, but the contrast seem to be too stark, a thin glaze can still be applied in the end to harmonize the colors without covering up everything that has been painted before. And usually glazes are great at the end of the painting as sort of a finishing stage for the entire thing and make things all more harmonious and make the final colors pop. Flat glazes can also be used to create what I can call a color boost. For example, you have an already strong blue drapery but want to make it pop even more so you can glaze blue over blue and get something very strong. Transitional glazing is something different. It's much closer to the sfumato made famous by Leonardo da Vinci. In this case, the function of the glaze is not to cover the entire area, but to make the transition smoother and blend with colors. In this case, the glaze is usually made with less chromatic transparent pigments, closer to skin tones, for example, like transparent burnt amber, transparent red oxide, or transparent yellow ochre. The point of this type of glaze is to boost the chromatic presence of the object by only emphasizing the soft gradation between lights and shadows. Applied over the transition, a thin glaze reinforces the chroma very efficiently without making the entire form too saturated. Hybrid glazes. Glazing is mostly an oil painting technique, of course. But it's not limited to this medium. Note that an oil glaze can be applied over a coat of egg tempera, alkyd paints, or even acrylic paints. All these options have the great advantage of taking a couple of minutes to dry, rather than the days that you usually have to wait for an oil underpainting to dry. You can therefore start your underpainting with acrylic and only finish with oil glazes, given that you won't add acrylic on top of the glazes. And with this technique, like the old masters in the past actually, you save on the more expensive oil paint and still have some pretty intense colors that only an oil glaze can bring. Make sure that you really wait for the acrylic paint to, to be completely dry, otherwise the oil glaze won't work. Remember, the process doesn't work the other way around. You cannot apply acrylics on top of oil paints. This hybrid technique is pretty interesting and it can help you mix oil and acrylic in a very coherent way and it will extend the appearance of the acrylic, which is normally very matte and dry. 
Glazing with oil on top of acrylic is a great option with a real sheen and depth that acrylic alone cannot allow, even with all the mediums in the world. You don't need a special glazing medium to glaze successfully. I suggest that you use the medium you normally use. However, if you want to have a really shiny surface to reveal the gloss of the glaze, you can try this one. Two parts Venice Turpentine, four parts Linseed Stand Oil, nine parts Demar Varnish, and nine parts Turpentine. Again, I still suggest to use a regular medium to glaze. The most important part is not the medium, but the transparent pigments. Not all paint can be glazed. Opaque paints will not work, even with the right glazing medium. The glaze technique requires a careful approach and it cannot always be applied. It's a method that really makes the colors stand out. If you replace transparent pigments with semi-opaque or opaque pigments, you don't technically get a glaze, but what I call a velatura. This technique is applied exactly like a glaze, but gives a less intense result. Due to the fact that it's not perfectly transparent, it's similar to what you could achieve by direct mixing. It's a technique can, that can be interesting to modify shadows on a portrait or to create very smooth transitions between shadows and lights, sort of like what da Vinci did with his famous sfumato. All right, that's about it. I think I've talked about pretty much anything there is to know. With the first video, you have pretty much everything you need to know about glazing. Thank you very much for watching this video and again a huge thank you to my Patreon members. This video wouldn't be possible without your support. If you want to join the community, you'll find a link in the description below. You'll also find a link to both my courses, my oil painting course and my color course. Glazing is covered in depth in both and demonstrated in multiple painting situations, portrait, still life and landscape. I'm sure you can learn a lot from it. All right, again, thank you very much for watching. I'll see you in the next one. And until then, have fun painting, joy and inspiration to you.